Okay. And then you can edit it later. Sounds good. All right, I'll be back in a flash. Yeah, so John Bernier will be taking this file. So uh, as long as everybody knows, um, I think he's going to be kind of listening in tonight. Um, okay. I didn't want to go too heavy on him on his first day back from uh, pat leave. So I just, I was nice to him and <laughs> asked, kindly asked him to chime in, but that. Uh, we'll just make sure place. that Jeff says that because um, we're going to go over a lot of um, process related questions. Yep. Um, so we'll make sure to explain like you're the face tonight and but moving forward john will be taking over and right. and who's email to use and all that stuff but worst comes to worst if someone emails you feedback you just forward it to john i just the the world. i just delete it without looking no no <laughs> people are kidding. listening that. <laughs> that's horrible that's just no i uh, I've, I've already dealt with a few people and uh i i i just uh answer them and uh point them towards John for uh, follow-ups, so that's fine. And I don't think I've worked with John before, so is he new to Central? Mm, he is, how long has he been? Uh, before his three-month path leave, path leave, I think he was around for about six months. Okay. Before that, so he was in the South group before that. Okay, well, welcome to Kitchissippi. It's, it's super fun. <laughs> One second. And Fiona, we're going to run it the same way as last time, where there are the the questions coming in through Q and A. Oh, you're on the phone. Sorry. And move this over here. Participants, attendees. Hi, everyone. I'm on. Nope. Um, it's seven o'clock now. We'll give it another minute or two as people start to pile in a bit more. Yep, people are coming in. And Vincent, you have a presentation teed up, I assume? Uh, I've got one, actually, Jeff. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, Nick, you've got one? Okay. Yep. So we'll uh, we'll run this one like the uh, previous one in which we will um, – uh, I've got some opening uh, just uh, stuff to say. Um, Fiona's going to take us through some housekeeping. Then we're going to go into the um, – uh, into the presentation. So I'm just trying to see if Fiona is – Almost done here. Okay, you know what? I'll uh, I'll start because we're 
starting to run in here. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Leeper. I'm the city councilor for Kitchissippi Ward. Uh, and this development obviously is uh, is in the ward, just a little to the east of our boundary at Sherborne Maitland, which uh, leads over to Bay Ward. And uh, we're here tonight to hear about uh, Claridge Development's proposal for a, I think it's a 22 and nine story development at the 1705 Carling site. Um, I just wanted to start this open house a little bit differently than I have others with a little bit more process. Um, I know that this community has not been through the uh, called onslaught of development applications that have been happening um, in Hintonburg and Wellington Village and further uh, north in Westboro along Scott Street. Uh, it's it's a, an extremely active uh, ward with development files. Um, a lot of that is being driven by uh, transit considerations. Uh, but this is uh, one of the uh, big applications for the south end of, of Westboro McKellar Park. So I know folks have not been through the process um, uh, a lot so I'll take a minute or two or a couple minutes just to talk about where we are. Um, the uh, new owner Claridge has applied for a rezoning so currently what they are proposing to build is not allowed under our zoning bylaw and like any property owner uh, in Ontario they are free to come forward to City Council to apply for uh, something different than what the zoning allows and that's going to be looked at through the lens uh, by the city and city council of um, a number of different policy documents. There's an official plan for the city that describes uh, how growth should occur in areas like this. Um, there is um, a provincial policy statement that uh, we have to take account of that describes how cities are supposed to grow. There's no secondary plan for this neighborhood, so there's no neighborhood sort of specific plan guiding growth. So the planners are going to be looking to the official plan for their guidance. Tonight's meeting is is uh, just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, this meeting isn't a, an official meeting. The uh, meetings the councillors hold to introduce people to the developments um, are a best practice. It's something that I always do, but it's not, uh, it's not the official hearing and it's not your last chance to raise concerns and, and have the discussion uh, over the course of uh, several months with the developer, with me and with the planners. We do have a city plan uh, who's on the file, uh, although he's going to be uh, soon replaced by John Berner. Uh, Jean-Charles? Uh, it's uh, John Bernier, but uh, Bernier, otherwise you're, you're very correct. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so John Bernier will be taking over. Uh, essentially, this uh, file should probably be, I'm going to guess, in front of city or in front of the planning committee of city council for a vote. Um, I, I can't see it being any time before December, uh, probably January. I know uh, Vincent may want to get in front of planning committee sooner, but uh, the um, uh, the the staff is. Uh, is fairly backed up at this point and it is rare so I know many of you received notes and I received a few emails in return that said that the comment deadline is uh, I can't remember July 4th or something like that uh, and that the on-time application uh, date is August 31st that virtually never happens the city uh, virtually never uh, provides a decision on the files within um, the 120 day period set out by the statute the developers know that uh, and and they don't press. So we're going to be uh, talking about this file through the course of the summer and my guess would be through the early fall as well. And from this meeting, this is your opportunity to first off uh, ask questions about the proposal. It's the introduction to the project itself. Um, you know, ask the detailed questions that you need. Um, and, if, you know, that can be uh, from everything from uh, how many parking spots does it have all the way up to how does the developer consider that this meets with the city's official plan. Uh, the uh, planner uh, Jean-Charles is going to be here. He's going to be taking notes and listening to what the concerns are that are raised. Raise your objections. Uh, now is an early chance to say, you know, I'm concerned about how much parking there is. I'm concerned about how much parking there isn't. I'm concerned about how high it is. I'm concerned about the shadows that it's going to create. I'm concerned about traffic impacts. Um, and and we'll take note of all of those sort of things. From here, uh, it becomes a, a bit of a loosier, goosier process where uh, 
I encourage you to engage with uh, Jean Bernier, um, who's going to be the planner on the file, and myself. There are going to be some things where the developer is um, uh, going to be challenged by the city on whether or not uh, it achieves what the city needs in order to be able to recommend it. There are going to be areas in which I'm challenging them to do something different on your behalf. Uh, and then at some point, uh, and again, I'm going to guess this fall, um, the planner on the file is going to start writing a report that makes a recommendation to city council as to whether or not it should approve the file. Um, that will, uh, the, the planner will make a recommendation that will be voted on by the planning committee and then it will get voted on by city council. So generally the rhythm we see is that there's a lot of very um, nitty gritty back and forth between the planner, the developer, me, you, uh, until that report gets written. And then uh, it will often become, once we know whether or not the city is actually going to approve recommend or recommend approval of it or not, it starts to become more political where I'm talking talking more with my um, colleagues around the council table. Some of you will be talking to my colleagues around the council table until we go to that vote. Uh, then it gets voted upon. Um, Generally speaking, nothing goes to get voted on if um, uh, the city is recommending refusal. Uh, it's, it's not worth the developer's time for staff to recommend a refusal and go all the way through a vote. They will generally only proceed once they have that recommendation for an approval. It gets voted on by city council and then city council's decision can be appealed to, um, many of you probably know it as the OMB, the Ontario Municipal Board. It's now called the Local Planning Appeals Tribunal and the local planning appeals tribunal will take a second look at it in light of whatever objections have been made either by the community uh, or by um, the developer so if we if we refuse the application the developer will appeal it if we approve the application somebody in the community might appeal it and i'm very happy to talk with folks offline about what that appeals process looks like um, so tonight is you don't have to get all the concerns on the table um, I, I encourage you to follow up by email email with me with the planner uh, because that's where the really important engagement starts to happen as the arguments start to get uh, bandied back and forth between all the different parties yeah we'll take uh, early quick note tonight of what the concerns are uh, but the most substantial work is going to start happening largely by email uh, over the course of the next uh, next couple of months as um, uh, we head up for the uh, the planner getting ready to write their um, their recommendation so with that I just will ask uh, Fiona to uh, talk to folks about what the format of this meeting is like. It's only the second time we've done it like this. I was really pleased with the first one. Fiona, take it away. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, in a second, I'll turn it back to Jeff, who will turn it back to uh, Claridge and their team. Uh, um, Claridge and their urban planning consultants will run through a kind of like PDF uh, presentation that you'll be able to see because we'll be sharing the screen. Uh, and then we'll move into a Q&A. Uh, in case you didn't see the, the little note in the, in the chat, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can type in a question and I can see it right away. You won't be able to see all the other questions that other people are asking. I can let you know that I currently have four in the queue right now. Um, once we move into the Q&A, I will take them one by one um, and I will try to get a diversity of people. So if you write multiple questions in a row, I may just ask one and then go to the next person just in, in the effort of being fair and same with kind of similar questions. Um, if you feel as though your question was missed for whatever reason or wasn't answered, uh, you can definitely email us and we can make sure that you're getting all the appropriate information. Um, so I hope that's clear. Um, and you can also ask a question about the format in the Q&A. Like it doesn't have to be, if, if, if something's confusing and just, you can reach out to me via the Q&A because I can see it. Um, and yeah, so I'll turn it back over to, to Jeff, I guess. Yeah, so normally in these open houses, we then turn it over to the developer who will uh, give us the um, the rundown of what it is that they're proposing. Uh, Vincent Denom is with uh, Claridge. Kirsten Nietzsche is with uh, Foten, who are the planning consultants on the file. Uh, and Nick Sutherland is with uh, Foten as well. Um, and then uh, Jean-Charles is here uh, to listen. So Nick or Kirsten, I guess I'm turning it over to one of you two to uh, take us through the presentation. Yep. So I'll be doing the presentation this evening. Um, just one second, I'll share my screen here. Uh, 
How's that? Good. All right, so uh, actually I'll just throw it into the, yeah. All right, so yeah, as uh, thank you, Jeff, for the excellent introduction and thank you, Fiona, for setting us all up. And also thank you everyone who's participating online. It's actually my first virtual open house. I've done several in the past, but my first time to be doing it under these circumstances. So uh, let's get going. So. So I have here just uh, some emails that I'll put at the end as well. Although I recognize that Jean Charles is no longer going to be the file planner. We can get to that at the end though. So just speaking a little bit to the location of the site, it's fronting onto Carling Avenue and is located within the Kitchissippi Ward. It also has um, Tilbury Avenue on its rear side, although there is no access from the site to Tilbury. All of the access is done via Carling Avenue. Some additional site context here. There we go. So uh, each of these views demonstrates the general kind of area around the site. Um, the area north of the subject property is generally low rise, um, some small pockets of low rise, low rise apartments, um, mostly ground oriented dwellings, detached dwellings and townhomes. Uh, there's a few schools in the area as well as the Dover Coat Recreation Center. Uh, east of the subject lands is mostly commercial and auto oriented along Carling, as well as the intersection with Highway 417 further east of that. There's also pockets of low rise residential dwellings and some slightly higher density office and residential uh, interspersed throughout. West of the subject lands is pretty similar along Carling Avenue, mostly auto oriented uses and Notre Dame High School not too far along. Uh, south of Carling is uh, the Canadian Tire and some of those light industrial commercial uses uh, that are between the highway and Carling. So just to give you an idea of the existing conditions, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the site. Uh, it's the former Webb's Motel as well as where the Rose Bowl Steakhouse restaurant used to be. Um, there's also a single detached dwelling at the rear of the property towards Tilbury Avenue. Um, in photo three, you can see a little bit of the top of the house uh, peeking over the hedges there, um, as well as uh, the existing buildings as viewed from Carling Avenue. So I'm going to touch on a bit of the policy context first, just to give you a general idea around that. I won't get into too much of a comprehensive uh, review of the policies, but the planning rationale available on uh, the City of Ottawa Development Applications website goes into quite a bit more detail with regards to the policy context. So the lands are designated arterial main street in the official plan. Uh, as you can see in the image on the screen, at Carling Avenue is an arterial main street. Um, as part of these policies, there are a number of them that are applicable to this site. Um, policy number five is encouraging a, a broad mix of uses on Carling Avenue, and those can be retail, commercial, residential, office, and they also have the option to be combined into one building, uh, which we know as, as mixed use buildings. Um, so another policy that we're leaning on here is that policy 10 uh, is encouraging of infill and redevelopment on arterial main streets. And one of the ways to do this is through intensifying land that's not being efficiently used, um, as well as promoting pedestrian oriented development and access to the sidewalk, which we think we've achieved pretty well in the design of this building. One policy I will touch on in a little bit more detail though is policy number 12 here, which speaks to building heights and uh, what is permitted in the arterial main street designation. So policy 12 states that heights up to nine stories are permitted as of right. However, if there is a secondary plan, it may state otherwise, and that would be the height to follow. In this instance, as Jeff mentioned, there is no secondary plan applicable to these properties. And so there is the ability to go above that height limit that's been uh, identified. So the policy states that where secondary plans do not limit the height on an arterial main street, these high rise buildings above nine stories are permitted through a zoning bylaw amendment, which is the application process we're undergoing for this file and where the building will be located at one or more of the following nodes. So it has to be in one of these locations listed and the location that matches uh, the criteria of the proposed development is that of being within 400 meters walking distance of a rapid transit station on schedule D of this plan. 
So the property is um, a little over 100 meters away from a planned rapid transit stop at uh, Clyde and Carling, I believe it is. As well, uh, you'll see in the little paragraph at the end there, in addition to being at one of those locations, their development must also provide a community amenity and adequate transition to adjacent low-rise neighborhoods. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit more, but the community amenity is something that is negotiated throughout the process of approvals um, and will be something that is included as part of this development. Uh, it's just not something that we currently uh, have any knowledge about. Um, and, as, and with regards to the transition, uh, we speak to that a little bit more in the design and uh, the planning rationale online, but I'll touch on that in a second. So just to give you an idea of the existing zoning on the site, so um, this is an interesting site in that it is split zone, so it has two applicable zones to it, one being the residential first density subzone O, R1 O zone on the northern portion of the property, and then as you can see on the southern portion of the property is the arterial main street uh, subzone 10, AM10 zoning. Um, and just uh, to give you an idea of which uses are permitted where the retirement home use is not a permitted use on the arterial main street, or sorry, is a permitted use in the arterial main street and an apartment dwelling high use one portion of the lands as they are now. So I'll touch on the proposed development here briefly at a high level, and then I'll switch over to some of the architectural elevations and plans to get into a bit more detail of the site plan. But starting first with a 22 story tower. So two buildings are being proposed on this property. One of them being a 22 story high rise apartment dwelling that will be rentals. Uh, 194 units are proposed for the building. Um, they are divided as one bedroom, two bedroom and bachelor units as can be seen in the table there. Um, as well, the parking numbers are detailed here with 187 total parking spaces being proposed for this building, which includes uh, 169, I believe, for residents and 18 for visitors. Um, 97 bicycle parking spaces are being proposed for resident use, as well as one for the commercial uh, site. And there are seven total accessible parking spaces for that building. So similarly, the retirement home is being proposed at nine stories, also on the same site. And the retirement home is being proposed at 160 dwelling units. Um, 52 of those units will be what's called assisted care units. So these may be units that don't have a kitchen or um, are a little bit smaller without a bathroom. And a resident would also have access to uh, uh, some support workers, whether it's a nurse or a doctor that is on site. Um, and then there's also 66 parking spaces proposed for the retirement home. I will note that the underground parking garage is shared between the two buildings. So it is one garage beneath both buildings, but the uh, parking areas for the retirement home and the rental building are separate from each other. So you wouldn't be able to access one from the other. There's also 40 spaces proposed for bicycles for the residents and three accessible parking spaces on top of that. So I will just switch over quickly. So this here is the site plan. And once again, all these documents are available on the City of Ottawa website. Um, a few notable things on the site plan that I'd like to speak to is that you can see um, the access is being proposed from Carling Avenue as a right in and a right out access uh, in the center of the site. Um, from there, the underground parking access is proposed here for the uh, retirement home, as well as here for the rental. And a roundabout helps to uh, access both of them and then bring you back out to Carling Avenue. So there's also uh, lay-by areas in front of the main entrances, which are located interior to the site. So the red arrow here and here demonstrate where the main entrance area of each building is. Um, I'd also like to note that there are some accesses along Carling Avenue, active entrances for the commercial space, which you can see in orange here at the ground floor, and as well for the residential space, which you can see here at the ground floor. Um, so that just kind of adds a little bit of more pedestrian orientation uh, to that building in its frontage along Carling Avenue, drawing people to the street, drawing people from the street into the commercial space, things of that nature. Um, although that is what's being proposed for the rental tower, the retirement home does not have active entrances uh, proposed for the street. 
at first it was contemplated, but in further discussions with Claridge and uh, with the architect, it was determined that it wasn't operationally and functionally uh, good for a retirement home to have those entrances there, just from a security and safety perspective of the residents. So that's been eliminated since then. Um, as well, you can see, and I'll zoom in a little bit more so you can see the rear yard spaces. Uh, there's quite a few amenity areas proposed as terraces, outdoor activity areas for the retirement home residents, as well as a large rear yard amenity area for both the rental building and for the retirement home. Uh, surface parking is also interspersed in the rear yard area. Um, a few other things I'd like to touch on just on the site plan here would be some of the setbacks that are being proposed for the buildings. So the front yard setback is relatively minimal as uh, seven meters of the front yard has to be dedicated to the city of Ottawa for future road works along Carling Avenue, which is this portion you can see here on the screen. So the front yard setback is pretty minimal at 0 0.795 meters. Uh, the interior side yard setback along the east side yard is proposed at 4.39 meters along this section of the building and then juts in a little bit more to 10.14 meters, which uh, both meet the zoning bylaw. Uh, you can also see that there are pretty significant rear yard setbacks between both buildings to the property line uh, along Tilbury Avenue. So 35.7 meters for the retirement home and over 45 meters for the rental, prop or the rental building, um, leaving significant room in the rear yard there. Um, I will say the interior side yard setback proposed for the west side yard is slightly reduced at 2.78 meters and 6.67 meters further beyond that, uh, both of which are slightly deficient and we'll get that to that later. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on was just, excuse me, some of the ground floor uses being proposed for both. Um, I had mentioned that there's a commercial space proposed for the rental tower here, as well as some other amenity spaces, such as a multi-purpose room and a pool that will be accessible for the residents of that building. The retirement home uh, also has several personal service and amenity spaces, though these will be specific to the residents of the retirement home. And this includes uh, multi-purpose rooms, the library, nail salon, hair salon. Uh, there's a dining room and a kitchen for residents who need meals, um, et cetera. Oops, there you go. Um, one thing you can also note is the, the terrace in the rear yard here, which will be proposed at grade. So that uh, ties into the dining room of the rental or the retirement home and uh, offers the residents a chance to kind of connect with the outdoor areas in the rear yard. So I will just go down to show one other element that I wanted to focus on. These are the general floor plans, but I wanted to show you the seventh floor plans. Um, as you can see here, there are step backs proposed above the seventh floor for a terrace area for the retirement home, as well as a terrace area for the rental apartments above the seventh floor here. Um, so what that does is also brings in the building a little bit more and sets it back further from the property lines of the front and uh, east sides, um, improving a little bit of that transition that we had mentioned before to the low rise areas. So I will also, these are some of the elevations here, but I'll just go down to some of the perspective drawings as they show, uh, they do a good job of showing the development within the context of the area. Just bear with me one second. So these were prepared by the architect, but they give you a better idea of how the buildings might fit into the context of the area that exists currently. So this is a view looking north. Uh, this is Carling Avenue here, the nine story retirement building here and the 22 story there. Another view demonstrating the buildings from looking from the east. 
Uh, here's a view from the rear yard that I think does a good job of demonstrating uh, the existing landscaping and hedging that is proposed to be maintained, as well as what is proposed in the rear yard for the new development. And you know, these are maybe just placeholders for now, but they show that there's gonna be some quality landscaping as well as the terraced area that interacts well with the remainder of the yard that'll basically stay untouched in the way it is now. So just wanted to flip over to the landscape plan as well, very briefly. This is basically the same plan that I showed you earlier with the site plan. Um, the one thing you can note here is there's some additional details for tree plantings. Uh, for example, along Carling Avenue, there's several large trees proposed. Uh, you can also see quite a bit of shrubbery proposed along the edges of the buildings and the entrance areas that will very much improve the kind of pedestrian oriented nature of the site and the internal connections. Um, as well, along the edges of the uh, property, along the north edge, east portions of the west, there is a large hedge that is currently existing. Um, it is intended to be maintained as best as possible because it is a, you know, a healthy hedge and it does provide a degree of privacy and separation from other areas in the neighborhood, including along Tilbury Avenue. I will also note that there's uh, connections note, uh, shown here, but as I said earlier, the active entrances for the retirement home are not to be included, but they will have active entrances along Carling Avenue that connects to the remainder of the site. Um, you can also see there's kind of improved surface treatments between the main entrance areas as well as the roundabout that'll really give it a nice look and feel whenever you're walking along these areas. So I'm just going to flip back to my slides here. I'll just touch briefly on what is being proposed as part of the zoning amendments and where the deficiencies in the bylaw are. So as I had stated earlier, the property is split zoned. So there is an R1 zoning on the northern portion and then AM10 on the southern portion. As part of this zoning amendment application, uh, we will be seeking to remove the R1 zoning and have AM10 zoning cover the entirety of the site. In addition to that, I had alluded to the permitted uses earlier and a, an apartment dwelling high rise is not a permitted use currently in the AM10 zone. And so it will have to be added as part of this zoning amendment to permit the 22 story rental tower. As well, um, the maximum building height is currently 30 meters for an AM10 zone. As we're proposing 72.51 meters or 22 stories, it will have to be amended to reflect that. Um, and the basis for this being those policies I mentioned in the official plan earlier. As well, uh, the relief from the ground floor facade active entrances provision. And this is the provision I spoke to regarding the retirement home. Um, it's just not possible to provide active entrances due to the sensitive nature of the retirement home use. And so we'll be seeking uh, relief from that provision as well. Um, I had also mentioned the interior side yard setbacks and how they were deficient slightly. So we're proposing a 2.78 meter setback when a three meter is required and a 6.7 6.67 meter setback when a 7.5 meter setback is required. So these are deficiencies of 0 0.22 and 0 0.83 meters, which are relatively minor uh, deviations from the requirement. Nick, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, and I, I won't butt in too often, but sure. um, there's uh, the relief from ground floor facade, active entrances provision. What does that mean? So active entrances, uh, there is a definition in the bylaw for it, but essentially active entrances are entrances that have glazing that are accessible for people off the street, as well as residents of the buildings. Um, so, you know, you may see that as more, um, many mixed use uh, buildings in your ward have uh, active entrances and have good examples of that. Um, so, as I had mentioned earlier, the rental building will have active entrances, but the retirement home will not. Thanks. Um, the last provision that will be seeking relief as part of the zoning bylaw amendment is a relief from the mature neighborhoods overlay. Um, so as we are not proposing any low rise dwellings or ground oriented dwellings and we're proposing a high rise building, uh, we're seeking to remove blanket remove this provision uh, to permit the buildings as they are. So with that, um, I think I think I've covered essentially most of the proposed development and what we're seeking as part of the amendment. 
Um, unless Kirsten has anything else to add, or if I saw you want to speak to any of the details that have been mentioned, um, I suppose we could open it up to any further questions. Yeah, and what I'm going to do, thank you very much, Nick. Um, I think that's a good overview. I'm sure folks have lots of questions about some of the details on there. Um, but the community, a number of neighbors through uh, one of the residents uh, has asked that uh, because of the format of this, that we read a, um, a, a statement or a number of concerns that they have. So maybe I'll ask uh, Fiona to do that. Yeah. Um, okay, so on behalf of our neighbors, I'd like to thank Councilor Jeff Leeper for hosting this meeting and thanks to John Bernier, city planner and Claridge representatives uh, for attending. I'm just going to go and throw in, they say, thank you, FOTEN as well. We are a dedicated group not resistant to upcoming changes. Webb's property needs to be demolished. It is a major health uh, and safety concern. Please know that we are engaged and we've been doing our homework and we'll be making an intelligent and reasoned submission to the city planner. We are impressed with much that is in the city's new official plan. In preparing for an anticipated demand um, of nearly 200,000 new residential units in the next three decades, the city plan presents a vision that includes important features such as growth, growth that is compact with an appropriate range and mix of housing, including affordable housing and three bedroom plus units, intensification with priority to build around rapid transit, promotion of 15 minute neighborhoods that will minimize the use of private vehicles while increasing active transit, such as walking and biking, climate change considerations, including 100% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Number three, there are many positives in this current site proposal. A, Northern perimeter to remain closed, fences and hedges to stay and residential zoning stays. B, plans also seem reasonable for east and west perimeters. However, the details will need to be fleshed out. C, we support a retirement community and are encouraged by Claridge's track record in this domain. Four, we need to understand the vision plan for Carling Ave. Without this, it is difficult to make intelligent comments on key items such as height, density, setback, traffic, parking, etc. Number five, Although Claridge's proposal looks to the future, there are immediate concerns that are impacting the community, especially those living on the border of the property. The demolition is about to restart and we need to know how it will be done with the health and safety of the community in mind. We are requesting that those most impacted by this will be consulted prior to the demolition, preferably face-to-face -face with the developer. And that is it. Did anyone want to comment on that before I, I move forward to additional questions? Nope, I mean, well received. Thank you for sharing. We'll, uh, we'll share that with uh, the developer and planner in its written form as well. Perfect. Perfect. So I will start to move to the questions. I have 11 <laughs> in the queue. Um, you're welcome to keep adding to it and we will uh, hopefully get to it. Um, so the first question, uh, I will let the collective questions be submitted by the group of residents who have been working with you rather than one of off, uh, but here are a few of my smaller side issues. Number one, parking on neighborhood streets is already problematic due to overflow from Broadview Medical Center. Some days Wesley is so parked up I have to avoid the stretch between Broadview and Highland because I can't get my vehicle through. The overflow on par and down Highland at our intersection is already increased due to no parking closer to Broadview Medical, and this will likely only add to the issue. With so few parking spots for vid visitors and tenants, it's not a matter of, uh, of if they will park in our community, it's when. How will this be handled? So that's a pretty fair question, and frankly, it's one that I think we see pretty often. Is, is you know how do you find the balance between parking and uh, you know supporting other um, initiatives such as transit, and also how do you make sure that the parking is utilized by residents and visitors on site and not spilling into the neighborhoods? Um, so just looking at the zoning by um, the high-rise apartment would require 91 spaces. And the retirement home would require a total of 39 spaces, um, which we're providing 169 to the 91 and 66 to the 39. So in this instance, I think we've done a good job of proposing a balance. You know, we, we do realize that we're leaning on transit supportive policies, uh, but the reality of the situation is that transit 
is not there yet. And um, many people who buy apartments or will seek to live in this rental units and the retirement home will have vehicles and they will need to park them somewhere. So um, it's, it's definitely a tricky question and it's always a tough one to balance. But I think, uh, like I said, in this instance, we're providing over and above what's required as part of the zoning bylaw, but not so much that we're detracting from the transit and detracting from um, you know, promoting active transit and transit use. Um, you know, for speaking to spilling out into the neighboring streets and all that, there, there will be no access from Tilbury Avenue to the north. It's really only from Carling. Um, so I understand there, you know, there may be some chance that somebody could park in the neighborhoods around, but the physical layout of the site and the way that the parking is laid out uh, in the rear yard as well as underground really provides a lot of options for residents, visitors, and for the workers of the retirement home, as well as the commercial space in the front. So um, yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you. Why does the zoning amendment uh, application summary not mention that 35% of the property is currently zoned R10? Um, the application summary online, I'm assuming, but- I think, Yeah, I think. Yeah. I, ju I just took another look at that and you're right. It's, uh, it's listed as changing the zoning from the AM10 to an AM10 with the specifics and doesn't mention rezoning the, uh, the R10. Okay, um, I, I know it's mentioned in the planning rationale um, and it's part of the amendment that we were asking for. Perhaps that was just a I, I'll chime in. Uh, that looks like it's uh, probably an oversight on my part in drafting the uh, application uh, summary. Uh, that being said, uh, all the materials are um, available online, like your, the uh, planning rationale submitted, which do reflect the um, relief requested, which will be uh, both the uh, R10 zone and the <clears throat> AM10 zone. So I apologize for that. Thanks, Jason. Okay. An additional issue I'd like tabled and addressed pertains to the water table and the effect any new structure on the 1705 site may impact on nearby residences. The homes along Tilbury, Parr, Briarwood, and Golden, built by Highland Construction Company around 1958 to 1966, were erected on land that was originally a swamp of sorts and had been filled in. The water table to this day rises and falls just below the foundations of many, if not all, the buildings in the area. I know this because I grew up on Briarwood, 1960 to 1968, and I have lived on Parr since 1991. My concern is that the extent to which the city takes into consideration and assign responsibility for the impact a major structure such as 19, so, sorry, such as 1705 may have on the stability of the water table. Is there a risk the table may rise or lower during the uh, following construction of the proposed 1705 towers? Rising may of course bring about basement floods and lowering may shift the soil beneath homes and affect foundations. Um, so, I mean, I could take a crack at this one, but certainly it's a little bit outside of the area of my own expertise. Um, there is a geotechnical study, I believe that was um, part of the application. Um, obviously, whenever it comes to developments of this sort and of this size, there are a lot of studies that have to be done. And this includes all the proper engineering studies, uh, erosion and sediment control, geotechnical, site servicing, stormwater management, et cetera. Um, so what I can say to you is that you know, all of these items and issues are reviewed in detail, both by the engineers hired by Clarge, as well as the city's own engineers, um, in order to ensure that none of those, those issues that you mentioned uh, do arise. So uh, I can't offer any guarantees myself, but I can say that all of the engineering components that normally go into a development are being reviewed as part of this application. If I... Uh... Uh, if I may, um, for those who may not have seen the documents online, um, there is a site, you can get to it by um, navigating through Google uh, Dev Apps. It's short for Development Applications. If you Google Dev Apps 
Ottawa, uh, you'll get to a website that has uh, all of the development applications in the city. If you navigate your way through to 1705 Carling, you'll see the uh, all the documents that are associated with this application, one of which is uh, the Patterson Group's um, geotechnical investigation. So they would have been monitoring the site. It's a, it's a large document, uh, but it would describe the expected impacts on the um, uh, on the groundwater and, and on uh, uh, flows in the area. Um, I'm just trying to see here it is a couple hundred pages long anyways or a hundred pages long. So do take a look at that and um, the city's engineering department will then have to take a look at the developers engineering report uh, and, and make sure that it's valid and that they agree with the methodologies and all those sorts of things. Okay. I will go on to the next one. Uh, please clarify access to the site during and post construction will enter and exit only via Carling. The material from the city talks of relief from provisions requiring active entrances along Carling Ave. Um, so I'll speak to the active entrances piece first. Um, as I alluded to earlier, the active entrances is more so on the building itself uh, rather than like an access. Um, so I think that's what that question was kind of getting to there of how the site would be accessed and what the active entrances are. So we're not removing any accesses. It's really just the one right in, right out. Um, perhaps, Faisan, you can touch on the during construction accesses. I'm not familiar with what's currently being done or what's proposed. Uh, right now, there's nothing proposed. I mean, that's something we do with the right away group once we get our building permit. Um, and they work with us to determine the best area to stage and to enter the site um, for the trucks and the removal of fill, et cetera, the cranes. And um, it'll, be, it'll be ensured that it's uh, safely done and the traffic is mitigated. We have tra traffic management plans that we put forward um, to ensure that there's safety on the site. And uh, I'll add from our office's point, uh, if this development is approved, um, something we put in every site plan um, for development of this scale is a condition that they are required to fulfill, which is a pre-construction meeting uh, with uh, immediately impacted neighbors. So once Claridge has determined who their contractor is going to be and the contractor has determined how they're actually going to build this thing, we'll host a meeting so that um, residents can get some high um, like timeline information, key milestones, talking about site entry and egress, um, where the truck traffic is going to go, what, what the impacts are gonna be. So some of those finer details will be available um, just in the future and, and we'll make sure to have that meeting with the community. Okay. Uh, Fiona, sorry, I was yeah. on mute. Um, one of the things that I've been talking to the city about uh, is uh, trying to ensure that traffic control plans come forward at the same time as site plan um, because it's uh, something that they're making some uh, progress on in Toronto and our planners have said that they're amenable to that as well. So I'm hoping when we get to site plan um, that you know you'll have a good idea of how you intend to build it, Vincent. Um, one of the one of the questions, uh, and I don't see it put in here yet. Uh, my assumption is that you know you are several years away from um, constructing this building. I know Claridge has a lot of properties. Uh, for those who may not know, site plan. Once the zoning is done, then the city does a second level of review uh, on the technical details. It's um, it's not as political a process, uh, but it's called site plan and the, the developer has to get approval for it. I don't know, Vincent, if you can address when you think you might actually move ahead with construction and thus submit you know, a, a site plan to us. So the site plan has been submitted uh, concurrently with the zoning application. Okay. And um, that's something that, you know, the, the higher ups kind of decide what the timing is, but, but the right time is to move forward with the project, uh, the economic feasibility and everything. So I personally don't have those timelines, but you can see it, you know, maybe next year or the year after. Okay. Interesting. Um, so I do want to have a better idea if you're moving ahead with site plan and zoning concurrently. Um, by the time this goes in front of planning committee, uh, I would like to have some understanding of 
the basics of construction in terms of the the access. Not a problem. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Can we be assured? I don't. So okay, I'll just read the question. Can we be assured by city planning that the R10 zoning along Tilbury Ave and Tilbury Ave West at the north end of the site will remain R10 residential as a buffer and future protection between the AM10 zone development and the residential neighborhood, and not be changed to the AM10 as requested by Claridge? I'm. I'll let the panelists figure out who to answer this, but I don't think the planner will be answering this right now. Um. I mean, it is part of the requested zoning amendment that we'll be, we are intending to remove the R10 zoning on the northern portion of the property. Um, so, I mean, unless JC has another comment. Uh, no, like I said, um, the app application summary does say that it's AM10 to AM10 exception, but I will update that and uh, post that again on the uh, dev apps website tomorrow, uh, just to rectify the, uh, the oversight. Um, but although the whole site will be rezoned to AM10 exception, there is still uh, the site plan process. And it, it, it seems by the, uh, the proposal that there is some effort made to transition into the neighborhood. So uh, while the R10 zone might disappear, perhaps the intent and the, 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 the smaller scale intended by that zone can still be preserved uh, through the, uh, the development of the site. I can just um, mention that that existing R1 zone does not have a building in it. There's just a bit of parking encroaching into that zone. So it, there is still a buffer there. So Vincent, I think residents are concerned <clears throat> that if the uh, zoning on the full site is made AM10, that at some point um, another building could then get uh, built in the remaining portion of the lot. Um, and I don't know if um, maybe Nick can address or JC can address what I assume would be fairly shrink-wrapped zoning coming out of this, um, and and you know how the how the zoning works in, in terms of step backs and setbacks and what has to stay open, etc. Um, and then I also am interested to find out if there is a portion of the property that's not going to have any building on it that requires a rezoning. Why couldn't we simply leave it as an R one O? Maybe, uh, Councillor, I'll chime in here. Um, I think as JC said, um, and Nick both said, this is the proposal before the city um, to review. And of course, through JC and John Bernays review and the city's review, they'll determine if that request to AM10 for the whole lot is appropriate. Um, but as, also, as you uh, mentioned, you, you can shrink wrap zoning. So that might be um, a tool they use if they do move forward with this to make sure that minimum setbacks are required or you know, max minimum amounts of landscape space are, are provided on the site. Um, I think it's also important to note, like if there's a lot of plans online and um, part of the plans for this include the servicing plan for the site. Um, and because of the size of the site, Claridge is able to make full use of it, not just for, you know, building and outdoor amenity, um, but there will be stormwater infrastructure in that rear area of the lot too. So they are using it for the proposed development um, and it will be encumbered by infrastructure. So it might prove difficult in the future to actually develop it with something else due to that infrastructure um, on the rear portion of the site. So there's a lot of factors to take in, uh, into consideration, um, but you know, uh, moving forward, that will be something that I think, you know, JC and John Bernie will review as this comment with respect to the R1 zoning. Okay, next question if people are ready. As an immediate adjacent property, it is interesting that there's not mention of our residential homes to the west of the land. How does a 22-story building offer a good transition to our home next door? So to the west of the lands? <clears throat> um, so I guess that would be the retirement home. So the 22 story tower is on the other side of the property, but I will reiterate a few of the transitional elements that have been proposed as far, uh, this far in the design process. So um, the, sorry, the 22 story building has a uh, 10 meter setback from the tower to the east side property line, um, as well as the large setbacks in the rear yard towards Tilbury. So, 
those are some of the transitional elements for the tower. Um, I, if I understand the question, the resident is actually uh, abutting the retirement home, um, which is slightly reduced in size and not as big at 22 stories. It is being proposed at nine stories. Um, so as part of some of the transitional elements there, we saw the step backs being proposed above the seventh floor, as well as the terrace uh, in the rear yard. So the amenity area that's going to be between the retirement home and the property line and the maintaining of the hedges on that side as well. So um, ultimately, there, there's kind of a, a layer or a multitude of, of little things that are being utilized to provide that transition. Um, obviously, we made more of an effort on the 22 story tower to transition to those low rise that are located east of there, um, seeing as the impacts of a tower are a little bit greater. Um, another thing is uh, basically, as the site is a north-south site, the shadows, most of them really fall north and west. So for those properties abutting to be west, as this resident I believe is, um, the shadowing impacts are very minimal from this development due to the orientation um, of the site. So I will say that there, you know, there is quite a few um, transitional elements. If I may, this is going to be one of the key questions that the um, the city planner is going to have to wrestle with. Uh, the developer can assert that it's a good transition, but ultimately it'll be up to the city planner to see whether or not they agree with that. Um, and then it will be uh, up to city council to make the uh, the final decision. Correct. So make make that argument, and and uh, if you don't feel that it's an appropriate transition, uh, do make sure that you get that comment to the planner over the next few weeks. Okay. Uh, next question: One biking spot for the commercial use seems extremely low. If we are trying to promote a pedestrian slash cycling friendly development, why not have more? Thanks. Uh, that is a good point. I believe there is an excess. Uh, I'm not sure if there's an excess for that. No, so we are providing the required amount of parking spaces and for the commercial space, it would be one singular space. Um, but certainly, um, you know, being along Carling Avenue and wanting to attract, um, you know, not just shoppers, but also passers-by, uh, having perhaps more in the front area for the commercial unit would be uh, a positive for the site. So definitely can take that comment into consideration. Okay. Concerned about the deficient setback on west side being the primary homeowner affected, i.e. on the property line. Why is this necessary on such a large lot with two buildings, especially with common areas in that greater than six meter setback? This will be right on top of us. Seems like both together, i.e. Uh, deficient setback and putting areas to draw people in to this underside undersized setback is not reasonable. Okay, fair point. I mean, uh, that's certainly something we could have a discussion with the architect. There is, um, you know, part of the way that the buildings are oriented now is in order to accommodate enough setback on the east side for the tower, where really the massing impact is, is greater. Um, as well, there was uh, some thought to maintaining approximately 20 meters between the 22-story tower and the retirement home to make sure that it wasn't too crowded within the center of the site, um, particularly if we're going to have residents walking along those areas. Um, as anybody knows, in a high-rise area, if there's a lot of high-rise too close together, it's certainly a daunting feeling as a pedestrian. Um, but uh, that's certainly something that can be discussed with the architect. You know, setbacks can be massaged a little bit and moved around. Um, and perhaps we can find some efficiencies to reduce those setbacks on the west side and then not have to request a zoning. Um, it is definitely something that we can discuss and uh, thank you for the comment. Okay, what is the vision for Carling? There's been another similar rezoning application at 1655 Carling recently, which will add substantial intensification to the area. What is the plan to improve transit, pedestrian, and cycling along this street? Why allow these rezoning applications to happen piecemeal uh, rather than have a holistic vision? I 
thick yarn on the middle. You, you cut out a little bit there. I, do you want me to reread it? I'll just reread it. What is the vision for Carling? There's been another similar rezoning application at 1655 Carling recently, which will add substantial intensification to the area. What is the plan to improve transit, pedestrian, and cycling along this street? Why allow these rezoning applications to happen piecemeal rather than have a holistic vision? Um, I can certainly take a crack at that question, though perhaps uh, JC or Councillor Lieber would have some greater insights as to where the city's going for this area. Um, but obviously part of these developments is really leaning on the transit supportive aspects of the policies and uh, the fact that, you know, the city of Ottawa has invested quite a bit of money into that infrastructure. So trying to locate these kind of denser developments in those areas is uh, a key component of the official plan. And speaking to Carling Avenue as uh, arterial corridor, we know that it is a larger street meant to handle more traffic. And it's also identified as a transit priority corridor, I believe, and also uh, has this fine rate, I think, for cycling. So there are plans um, from the city of Ottawa to improve these facilities that you know, uh, Claridge and other landowners along uh, this, this corridor are going to want to um, basically uh, take advantage of this infrastructure, take advantage of those plans in order to build more homes and more dwellings for people who can live in closer proximity to their jobs, can live in closer proximity to transit, can live in closer proximity to some of these uh, community amenities that are needed uh, in order to create 15 minute neighborhoods and things like that. So these are all kind of higher level policy um, um, objectives that the city of Ottawa has. And certainly I'm sure JC and Councillor Leeper can speak more to that if they wish to. Um, um, JC jump in. Yeah, I, well, I think that's a uh, great overview. Uh, Nick, uh, the only thing I'd add is just that the staff will review this proposal uh, within the context of the uh, transportation master plan and vice versa as these uh, larger documents get updated uh, existing on the street. So they, they, they are not uh, <clears throat> approved piecemeal. They are uh, looked at within the context of, uh, of what the larger document, uh, the, the larger policy documents uh, tell us to do. Yeah, so I'll, I'll weigh in. Um, the city doesn't have a vision for Carling Avenue specifically, but what it does have is a view of um, how some of these big arterial streets are going to develop. And, and the city's view of them is that they're going to develop uh, tall and dense as we intensify and as we need um, uh, certainly a lot more rental housing in the city the thought is that those tall dense developments are going to go in places like Carling Avenue. Uh, the transportation master plan which I'm sure a number of you have looked at and uh, which I'm more than happy to send to people identifies uh, you know, first for uh, bus priority, and those are things that are happening um, as we speak. So they've got plans. Uh, it's a matter of putting together the budgets in order to prioritize uh, transit and also uh, cycling infrastructure. Uh, it will take them some time to put together the funding, but essentially, you know, they're getting close to have sho uh, shovel ready plans. And in some case, those plans are shovel ready. So they also want to put um, that cycling or they want to put the development that is next to that cycling cycling and transit infrastructure, uh, they want it to be tall and dense uh, in order to ensure that lots of people can live on that better transportation infrastructure. And then of course, finally, um, over the longer haul, this is identified as a secondary uh, rail route or a secondary rapid transit route. So the city could not afford to do it right now. Uh, they say they couldn't afford to do it until post 2031. But at some point, it's so when the city is looking at these sorts of developments, they're not looking um, at the short term, they're taking a long term view. These buildings will be here for the next 75 years. Um, and so the city doesn't want to um, 
put a lot of investment into all this uh, transportation infrastructure and have a number of buildings along there that don't meet with the density that's required in order to support that transportation infrastructure. So it takes a, it takes a long view and over the longer haul, uh, Carling will become a, um, a transit uh, corridor. It will become a, it will have some of the the, uh, the highest level transportation infrastructure in the city. Um, and the city expects that the density is going to be on roads like this. So there's, um, there's a vision for arterial streets like Carling, but there's no particular vision for Carling Avenue. Oh, over there. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, just a reminder to attendees, I'm trying to get everyone uh, gets at least one question in and then I will go back and start to ask additional questions from the same name. So don't, uh, don't fear if you are worried that your question is being overlooked. Okay, this project depends on the LRT being in place relatively soon. If LRT arrives in more than 10 years, why does the policy that allows building like this, buildings like this still apply? Uh, I think Councillor Leeper just made an excellent point towards that in his last explanation there. Um, you know, it's obviously a lot of things take time and transit infrastructure is another one of those things. So if we can put our plans into place now to have these sorts of uh, dwellings in place and at higher densities, as Jeff said, we want those people close to the services and the amenities that we're investing in. It's another, another case of that. So, um, you know, it's hard to say if it's going to be 10 years or you know 20 years but these are the sorts of um, proposals that are being put forth in order to support those plans those long-term plans okay thank you as a business owner in this neighborhood i can vouch for the terrible collision rate at carling and broadview how will this block tolerate a huge increase in traffic generated from both structures um, so once again, this one's a little outside of my area of expertise, but uh, there was a traffic or transportation impact assessment that was submitted along with the application uh, by Novatech Engineering, I believe. And uh, in that report, it details um, basically a lot of these transportation traffic and safety concerns. Um, my understanding of reading the report, the, the tra traffic and safety measures that are gonna be proposed will meet all of the uh, requirements of the city of Ottawa. And once again, this is another case where um, the city of Ottawa will be reviewing the report and reviewing all the statistics and numbers included in it as part of their assessment of whether or not it is appropriate. So once again, um, the report can state that and the city will verify it. So um, yeah, this is another instance where um, uh, we're doing our due diligence and uh, you know, the staff will do theirs as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, request that neighborhood behind is not impacted and does not strain the infrastructure of roads, sewers, water table, geostability, and the environment like birds, trees, etc. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, similarly, once again, um, as part of these applications, multiple studies, uh, reports, and plans are required. And um, in our earlier discussions with the city, they outlined what all of these requirements were. And we've since submitted all of those plans uh, to address you know, geotechnical, stormwater issues, servicing, all those things. Um, with regards to the neighborhood to the north and it, the impacts of this development on it, really we're orienting this entire development to Carling. Um, the intention is for it to be facing Carling, to be accessed from Carling, and as I said, the hedges will be maintained along Tilbury with the fencing. So it, it's not meant to be kind of a connection between the, the, the neighborhoods to the north and Carling Avenue. It's, it's gonna be its own site that is uh, fronting Carling and that is um, for Carling essentially. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, sorry, Fiona, just uh, one of the things, since you're moving ahead with site plan at the same time, um, it is a big tower, and I know I've got some concerns already around uh, making sure that it is bird-friendly. So, yeah. you know, before uh, before this goes to planning committee, I really want to hear 
uh, what you're proposing to do uh, with respect to adhering to bird friendly guidelines. The city doesn't have um, enforceable policies. We're in the process of developing those. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's something we need to insist on in each and every development moving forward. Noted. Um, I'm not sure, Vincent, if you have any experience um, in some other clearage files with this sort of thing. Uh, yeah, we're dealing with, uh, you know, the bird mitigation on other files along Carling and others in downtown area. I think we're just trying to wait for the bird guidelines that are coming out of the city's uh, engagement process. So we definitely worked with the city and with um, you know, design components to make sure that uh, we don't negatively impact the bird population in any way. Okay. Uh, the city official plan talks about the need for residential units with three bedrooms plus. Why are the rental units offering only a maximum of two bedrooms? Um, Vincent, want to take this one? Yeah, like that's more of a market demand uh, question. I mean, the one to two bedrooms are the sizes that we see are getting rented out the most. And as far as three bedrooms, those do get quite expensive in concrete construction. I mean, you can see in Rio can where uh, a two to three bedroom will cost you $4,000 a month. And um, we just don't see the demand. I mean, we could definitely talk about adding a few in um, the lower levels maybe, but uh, for now we just don't see the demand for those three bedrooms. Thanks. Okay. It's, uh, it's a very legitimate question and it's a, it's a concern I very much share with the community on that front. Okay, uh, can you talk about the shadowing that the buildings will cause on the homes in the area? A concern is obviously the dark shadow because of the high rise, not allowing the sun to reach many homes slash yards. Sure, um, maybe I'll share on my screen the shadow study that was prepared by the architect. So, let's see. So the, you know, as you can see here, um, as I mentioned before, the south is kind of a north, the site is a north-south orientation. Um, what's being shown on the screen right now is four snapshots of what the shadow impacts at particular times of the year are. So in this one, it is at the March spring, I believe, equinox. So you're showing here the 9 a.m. shadow impacts, noontime shadow impacts, 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. So as you can see, um, in the springtime, there are some shadow impacts to those dwellings uh, to the east along Tilbury and along Carling. Some slight impacts um, as well to the west during the morning and some as well falling kind of towards the site and Tilbury Avenue. Um, they're generally minimal in the springtime, as you can see, no property gets kind of blanketed with any uh, shadows for more than a couple hours. And I'll just go down to the, this is June 21st, so with the sun a little bit higher in the summertime, uh, you can see the shadow impacts are minimal in the morning, almost none around noon. Uh, in the afternoon, they start to creep on over to the east, and then south across Carling Avenue. And I think we have another, yeah, September here, demonstrating once again, uh, shadow impacts a little bit to the north and west, slightly again on the East Tilbury Avenue dwellings. And then at 3 p.m., there's some impacts to those buildings uh, just to the east of the property. And I think there's a December as well, yep. Uh, December, the shadows are a little bit lower, so it's harder to see here that there are not too many impacts, but uh, the longer shadows do extend a bit to the north around the noontime uh, measurement that they propose. So overall, the shadow impacts are, are slightly uh, manageable and not too bad just because of the depth of the site. A lot of the shadows fall within it and also fall onto Tilbury Avenue. Um, there's no seemingly no major uh, shadow impacts to any one property for an extended period of time. Okay, thank you. 
Why is there a request for a zoning change in the northern portion of the site that is currently zoned residential? And once rezoned, what would prevent an additional structure being built on the northern portion of the site? Uh, so I think Kirsten alluded to that a little bit in her previous comment uh, regarding some of the infrastructure that is proposed for that, that area. Um, ultimately, there is parking as well as the, out, the underground parking below. Um, so, you know, there is going to be infrastructure in that rear yard. There's also going to be space to be used by the residents in that rear yard. Um, you know, uh, I can't stay, stay for, say for certain that I'm not, you know, I'm not an engineer and I'm not sure what the servicing looks like under there. So um, I think that's a fair question. But once again, that will be reviewed in the context of the amendment and the studies that are submitted. You know, we are requesting to remove that R10 zoning, but it's not to say that we're looking to build high rise along Tilbury and in that area. I think Mason also mentioned that it does a good job of transitioning from the height that we're facing onto Carling to the rear yard where it's going to be amenity areas, landscaped, and uh, for use for residents to the hedges and all that's protecting and screening from the neighborhood to the north. Um, so although, you know, it's not, it is going to be AM 10 for the entirety of the site. It's not to say that there will be a high rise in the entirety of the site. If I, if I can, I think it's, um, I'll try again on uh, what shrink wrapping means in terms of the zoning. Um, so the, the zoning is not going to be a straight AM 10. This is now an AM10. It's going to be an AM10 with site-specific exceptions. Um, so I, the the zoning bylaw that gets passed is the edge of the building must be set back, and it, the setback that is prescribed is going to be whatever the setback is that you are proposing. So um, the building that goes furthest north is the retirement building. And it's the one that gets closest to the uh, to Tilbury. So the zoning is actually going to say there is a uh, setback required on this property of I don't know how many meters that is thirty meters to the edge of the building. It's thirty five, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to say anything that's built on here must be thirty five meters back from the northern property line, so that there's no as of right ability to then go ahead and put another building in there. The zoning that exists for this lot will be specific to this lot, uh, what the planners call shrink wrapping. Number uh, of required setbacks and stepbacks in the design um, that, uh, that describe exactly what is being proposed here or however this becomes modified over the course of um, the next several months. So even though the designation goes to being AM10, it would be against the zoning to build anything in that space because it would be physically impossible to have a building with 35 meters of setback from the northern property line when there's already a building that has 35 meters of setback from the northern property line. So it's, um, uh, it is a, I, I know where the community is coming from on this one. I think the community is concerned that at some point, if it's all AM10, that someone will be able to put another nine story building or 22 story building in the northern third of actually how the zoning would work. It would be zoning that is specific to this proposal and that describes exactly this proposal and building anything other than this proposal would not meet with the zoning. Okay, Thank thanks. Thanks, Rana. Okay, how has the builder ensured that there is no asbestos um, contaminant materials in the buildings that make up Webb's Motel? Um, I may add to this depending on who wants to answer. Um, so actually under the previous owner, Patterson did a, a DSS, a designated substance study on the building identified any you know toxic materials in there and our, demo our demolition contractor um, does abatement work prior to demolition to remove any toxic materials um, under Ministry of Environment uh, guidelines. 
So then when they actually do tear down the building, uh, the building is free of any noxious materials like asbestos or lead or what have you. Yeah, that's uh, in line with what I would tell a resident as well. Um, I also like to advise residents that if you are concerned uh, about uh, like these asbestos concerns, it gets very dicey because asbestos is managed at the provincial level and we're over here at the municipal level. You are welcome though as a resident to make a call to the Ministry of Labor or Environment. Uh, you'd make a call to the Ministry of Labor if you're worried that workers are interacting with asbestos and you'd make a call to the Ministry of Environment if you're worried about asbestos being in the air and contaminating the air. And uh, they will have someone who's able to connect with you and discuss what's on the, the DSS, uh, the designated substance study, um, more so than we, we can. So the study that was referenced, we don't usually get a copy and neither does building code services, it remains in the province. But as a resident, if you have a complaint or a concern, you can call the, the, those provincial entities and get that information. You can work through Joel Hardin's office as well if that's a little bit more helpful. And again, the demolition details we can work through when we have that uh, pre-construction meeting, depending on the, the timing of the, of the demolition. Okay. Who have you consulted in terms of creating the retirement home? Who will run it and what guarantees do we have that this will in fact be a retirement home? Um, uh, Claire Chalmers owns a a operator called Riverstone Retirement. Uh, we're in the retirement business. We have seven operating, I believe, and this is going to be our eighth, and we have a couple more in the works. So uh, there's no intention of doing anything other than a retirement home here. And, and um, a and the urban ex exception to the zoning will say that uh, Building A needs to be a retirement home. I'm not sure, but uh, there are ways to ensure that this will be a retirement home and not anything else. Okay, thank you. We don't have a lot of time left, so I'm trying to get to people who haven't asked a question yet. Okay, what happened to the public park that was promised in the original retirement building plan? You want me to speak? I can speak to that. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I actually was present at the last public meeting where we discussed um, the previous proposal for that. And um, it's interestingly enough, there was a very, um, strong reaction about proposing a park. Um, but with this specific proposal, due to the density, um, Claridge requires the full site for their proposal. So as I mentioned, there's some infrastructure located in the rear yard and um, they do have the option to use cash and move parkland, um, especially when the amount of parkland that would be required under the parkland bylaw is uh, very small. So I think, you know, uh, working with Claridge and their preferences and their needs for their site um, and you know using the feedback that was received from the last proposal um, moving forward was uh, the, the decision to do cash and move parkland as well so that will go into partially the ward fund and then partially the city fund and then in turn into uh, city parks in, in other areas okay thanks Um, okay, so we mentioned our concern about upcoming demolition in our opening remarks. Can the Claridge reps ensure that the community and especially affected households on the western and eastern perimeters be informed and engaged prior to demolition being restarted? So maybe Claridge can clarify if you guys are going to move forward with what we call a premature demolition, which means a demolition prior to the issuance of a, of a building permit, or if they're going to uh, wait until they have uh, approvals in place to demolish because I think that's adding to some confusion. Yeah, so we will be moving forward with a premature demolition um, only for the fact that it's a safety concern as the property owner we're liable for what happens on the property and um, over the time where we've owned it there's already been break-ins and, and you know uh, malicious behavior so we want to get it, rid of it as soon as possible just for that reason. Um, we've delayed the construction um, just as a courtesy to the residents. Everyone's home right now, and you know the dust and the the, uh, the activity is just not very very nice right now. But we will resume shortly, and we will demolish it um, when we can. We did go through de uh, demolition control, which is a planning process, and it was approved 
um, which does condition us to landscape those areas. So it will be, um, it will be cleaned up. So can you commit to um, a pre, in addition to a pre-construction meeting, a pre-demolition meeting with impacted neighbors once, like before a fence goes on the property, before we see a, um, a truck, can you make sure we're doing this again with the affected property owners so that they have questions about uh, the demolition specifically that they can be answered? Yeah, absolutely. I've been uh, in contact with a few of the residents already due to the COVID restrictions of gatherings. Uh, this was back in March, I think, in the thick of it. So we decided to hold off. But um, now that everything's kind of easing off, we can meet on site um, shortly, yeah. Okay, awesome, thank you. Oops. Um, there's a few different questions, and just because we're running out of time, I, I won't read them verbatim or I'll read them in quick succession because they're about the same thing. So one person is asking, uh, Nick, like Kristen, did not address why the rezoning is being proposed. And someone else is asking, Jeff, you have not indicated why that northern, sorry, I clicked it away, why the northern part is being rezoned. So basically people are asking why a zoning, a rezoning is, is being proposed. Sure. So I'll just put up on the screen here why we're seeking this amendment. So um, as discussed earlier, it was for the removal of the R1 zoning on that northern portion to allow AM10 zoning on the entirety of the site. Uh, additionally, a high rise apartment dwelling is not a permitted use in the AM10 zone as it stands. So we would like to add that as a permitted use in order to allow the, uh, the development as proposed. And the other provisions that we're seeking relief from are the height, um, the ground floor facade active entrances provision, which we're not meeting on the retirement home, as well as the relief from the Western interior side yard setbacks, um, which is on this side of the property here, which are slightly deficient and relief from the mature neighborhoods overlay. Um, so that is why uh, a zoning amendment is required. Um, technically, as of right, we could have developed only the southern portion of the site with the, the AM10, but in terms of what Claridge is looking to do and the building uh, format they've chosen, uh, we do need the full site. And, um, you know, for the reasons mentioned before, it makes sense to have the entirety of it rezoned to AM10. Sorry, so Nick, are you putting anything north of the dividing line into, yes. that, into that R10? That requires structures. Yeah, um, I think Vincent mentioned, and the site plan reflects it that there's really only parking that kind of extends into the back there. It might be I'm not sure exactly what the dimensions are of the zoning line compared to where the building is, but there may be a small portion of the corner of the retirement home that extends into that uh, R10 zoning, but I'm not 100% sure on that. One. Um, so this is something, uh, and, and I'm seeing a, a lot of questions around this, and um, uh, I know uh, residents are not necessarily familiar with, uh, with the planning process. Um, it's, it's probably not the biggest uh, concern on the site, but it is something that is coming up um, in a lot of the questions that we have. And I'd like to uh, continue that discussion with you to see whether we can uh, maintain some of that um, space along the north side uh, as R10. Okay. So to maintain some or all of the space? Well, obviously, um, if you are proposing, so it's R10, you're going to put parking in there, which is not allowed in the R10. So it would need to be R10 with a site-specific exception to allow the parking, obviously. Um, and then you would have to remove from that portion of the zoning anything that has any of the high rise in it uh, right. as well, because uh, that's not permitted in the R10 either. So it'd be interesting to take a look at what that line might look at, uh, might look like. So let's take some time and um, uh, noodle that through. I will just give folks uh, some assurance that you know that's not going to get developed as another high rise at some points in future yep that makes sense so fair. okay uh what is the rationale for piercing holes in the existing hedge 
Who are these pathways supposed to serve? Breaking up the integrity of this hedge is going to undermine it, this existing buffer to the surrounding neighborhood. Um, so I believe there's there's one proposed on the site plan, and I think there might have been two reflected on the landscaping plan. Um, maybe Vincent can chime in if he knows a little bit more about the kind of the operational side of it. But from my understanding, those are not public entrances. Vincent, maybe you can confirm. Um, yeah, it was under my impression that there was no punch outs other than the servicing um, block because these services do come from Tilbury. So okay. the storm water main and sanitary sewers and those would have to be easily accessed so that the city can maintain them um, therefore needing to take out at least one section of the uh, cedar hedge but um, through the site plan process we can talk with the city staff um, to see if that's a good idea or not it might stem from the previous proposal that to be there to have access but since the public park is not um, proposed anymore, we, we don't really need an access. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. And if that access was maintained for servicing only, I'm assuming that it would be fenced off and you know not easily accessible to anyone? Yeah. Okay. So a similar question, will there be any walking access from Tilbury Ave through to Carling? And then uh, we kind of talked about this earlier, will the high rise cause any shadow or privacy issues for the low rise building on Tilbury Ave? So yeah, as, I, as we just discussed a little bit there, um, there won't be a connection and it's not intended to be a connection from Tilbury to Carling. Um, if there is that opening in the hedges there, it will be for you know servicing reasons and it will have a fence. Um, with regards to the impacts to the uh, low rise on Tilbury, we did see that there was a little bit of shadowing impacts that do fall across um, towards the east and uh, to the north. Um, they're relatively minimal and there's no major kind of blockage of sunlight for any extended period on those properties. Um, it's also should be noted that, you know, there's kind of, I'm not sure if you can see any amenity areas, but I think there are limited amenity areas for those buildings. Um, you know, not that that really makes a difference, but um, the shadowing has been looked at as part of the architectural plans and um, it's also available on the city's dev app website for anyone who wishes to look at it in a little bit more detail. Okay. Uh, what parking is dedicated for employees? So I believe there is, uh, as part of the zoning bylaw, there's a requirement to provide spaces for both the commercial uses in the rental tower, as well as for um, the personal service areas, which would be areas where say the physio or a nurse or a doctor um, might be working. So there is spaces required um, as part of the zoning bylaw for the retirement home. I believe it's two service area spaces. Um, and on top of that, we are providing an excess of parking for the residents. So 37 spaces are required and we're providing 66. Um, so some of those spaces will likely be used by um, personnel of the retirement home as well. <clears throat> Vincent, I don't know if you have any further operational details than that. But. Yeah, having seven operating right now, uh, we just, we, re we have a good idea of what uh, the need is for parking for our staff. So um, we've, we that, adjusted that accordingly. Okay, so this is scheduled until 8.30. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna pick three more questions. There's 27, so unfortunately not everyone's questions are gonna get answered. But like we said, if your question doesn't get answered tonight, please email us and we're happy to get you that information. So I'm gonna pick three on three different topics. Sorry, um, uh, Fiona, can we capture the questions that have been uh, asked and unanswered? Uh, leave that with me. I will okay. I'll figure that out. I don't know. Thank but, you. Uh, just, yeah, I'll figure that out. Oh, you know what? I'm doing a copy and paste right now. Okay. Okay, so last three. Uh, I heard that you are basing a height addition request of well over 100%, 9 to 22 stories, on a might never happen transit hub at Carling slash Clyde. I think we have a right to say this given the recent history with LRT. And also requesting blanket exemption from 
requirement to blend into surrounding neighborhood. What is the purpose of city planning rules, plans, and guidelines if they can be so easily manipulated to maximize profit potential for a site? Um, so I guess speaking to the transit um, policies and what we're using as a basis for the density being proposed here, um, I mean, it is true. Uh, it is, you know, over 100% of what is currently permitted. Um, but I think one thing that needs to be said is that a lot of times existing zoning does not reflect the policies um, that the official plan may have or the policies that uh, the city is pushing for. And in this case, you know, there are policies that support this sort of density and height for the reasons that we discussed earlier, being the transit infrastructure, uh, as well as other infrastructure investments that the city of Ottawa is doing in this area. So, um, I mean, I forget what the second part of the question was. Uh, it's about, sorry, Nick, I can chime in. It's about the mature neighborhoods bylaw. So exemption our request to exempt the requirement to blend into the surrounding neighborhood and I guess speaking to that the mature neighborhoods bylaws or zoning provisions were created for the low-rise interior uh, residential neighborhoods and um, they pertain particularly to low-rise apartment buildings or low-rise dwellings you know single-family dwellings duplex etc um, and for the interior now this site falls within that area and there are some very specific um, zoning provisions that might be applicable and um, they are quite confusing and uh, to be honest um, the city's actually looking at revising those right now due to that confusion that so many people have with them um, but the main reason is that this actually faces onto Carling which is an arterial main street environment um, so to impose um, those zoning provisions is not, not appropriate because it doesn't front into the low-rise neighborhood it won't be functioning within the mature neighborhood itself. So, um, and, and as we've talked about today, the zoning for this will be shrink wrapped and the street front environment will, will be closely reviewed and um, looked at through the site plan process. Um, so, and also this will be going to the urban design review panel for review. So there will be some commenting on the urban design um, on this uh, application and it will look exactly at that, you know, how it, um, I guess transitions into the neighborhood and how it treats that public environment. So that will be captured through the site specific zoning itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, what portion of units will be affordable? Great question. Uh, so I can speak to that a bit. Um, Claire has been working with the federal government to um, provide a number of units that meet the definition of housing affordability. Therefore, uh, you know, 30% of the median income household. And that's something that we um, may consider for this site. Um, as far as affordable units, there are none proposed at this time. But under the housing affordability definition, that is something that we are looking into. It's one of the... Um it's one of the key considerations. The, the height battles, um, you know, we know that the city is intensifying. We know that a location like this is gonna be an area where city council is gonna be very amenable to the kind of height that is being um, proposed here. Uh, but in terms of hopefully influencing a project and trying to get uh, the city to oppose, or at least the politicians to oppose it, um, affordable housing is still one of those battlegrounds where it is worth it for us to continue to hammer home that message. Um, eventually, we'll have what's called an inclusionary zoning tool. Inclusionary zoning will allow us to require developers to put a certain minimum of percentage of affordable units in bigger developments like these. We don't have that tool today. Um, it is, uh, it's still far too far away, probably at least a year and a half or so. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, it's one of the things that concerns me about this project is the lack of affordable housing. Um, it's, uh, it's not going to be it's not gonna be the same kind of prices that we would see immediately adjacent to Westboro Transit Station, but uh, it is still going to be a very desirable place to live and it's going to be, um, it's not gonna be inexpensive housing. Uh, and I would like to ensure that um, 
as wide a cross section of people as possible can afford to live here and uh, so affordable housing is something I'll be talking to these folks a lot about over the next uh, next several weeks. Okay, thank you. Um, last question. How does this proposal serve the housing needs of families and children? The city plan indicates that current and future demographics require that new structures provide units of three bedrooms and more. This proposal is not offering more than two bedroom units. Um, I mean, I think Vincent did a good job of answering this from kind of the market perspective. You know, Claridge is uh, you know, very plugged into the, the housing market in Ottawa and if they're seeing that they can't sell those types of units then um, generally they're proposing others um, and this is one of those cases where one and two bedroom units are um, more desirable and um, yeah I mean obviously uh, as Vincent said there can always be a discussion about proposing more family oriented units uh, as we go forward so uh, it's always nice to hear those comments. Okay, so I think we are wrapping it up now. I'll turn it over to Jeff. Uh, thanks, Fiona, and thanks very much for uh, for the moderation there. Um, so, you know, this is not the last of it. I know there's a, a number of unanswered questions in the Q and A. Um, I would ask that people please write to um, me and to Jean Charles uh, with their questions and comments because now you know you've had a chance to take a look at the proposal um, and it's it's time to start putting together your arguments that are grounded in planning uh, grounded in policy forward to the city and if you're wondering what those policies are uh, by all means um, ask me or ask JC um, uh, you know there are there are things sometimes we don't like that are allowed by policies um, and then sometimes uh, we can find a clever policy argument uh, that gives some leverage in terms of getting a different development so it's it's really Really important over the next several weeks to um, uh, engage with us and let us know what your concerns are um, and then my job is to uh, assess you know what is what is likely to get approved by the City Council where do we have some leverage and where do we have some good policy arguments to make to try to get um, JC to push back at the developer for modifications to the development um, and uh, yeah, I just, I look forward to your engagement on this one. Both Fiona and I are available to uh, talk to you uh, very objectively about, you know, the, the context in which this application is being, being made. So I don't want to interrupt, but I can't seem to copy and paste the questions that have already been typed in. So I do apologize if you uh, asked a question or submitted a comment and we didn't read it out loud, if you could email it because I, I for some reason, I, I can't on my computer copy and paste it. I'm really sorry. Uh, okay, well, don't don't close the meeting too soon. Uh, so, folks, um, oh, Kirsten, did you want to? I was going to say, Fiona, I think you can right click on the question and it says select question and answers. So, I think that will work. Maybe. Okay, we'll talk about it after. Maybe someone yeah. can help me after. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, everyone. And um, I look forward to uh, keeping the discussion going. Have a good night. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And I have. Okay, so I can select it, but I can't seem to. I've got it. No, you don't have to do it. I can... Well, I've got it. I've got it. I did it. I did it. Right now, I'm looking at a note on my screen. I've pasted them all in there. So there's uh, some really interesting ones. So what I'm going to propose we do is pull out the questions that, you know, some of these are, are a bit repetitive to what has already Attend been asked. Attendees are still here, by the way. Yep. Um, so there's a number of them uh, that are a little bit repetitive to what I've already asked, but there are some uh, other ones that are actually really specific and, and need, a, um, uh, need a full answer. So uh, let's get the answers to these where it's, uh, where it's a new question. And okay, then, and you, uh, post that you the blog, or uh, send it to the email list of uh, of people who uh, received. Yeah. Oh, we don't have an email list, right? I do have an email list. I lose, use the same one from when we did this before. So there's probably new people. Oh, but perfect. Okay. I I used an email thread from that. Yeah, and then I'll um I'll take the names out and stuff. So. 
Yeah. So did you copy and paste all of them? Um, yeah. Oh, no, just the ones that uh, were unanswered. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like the remaining ones. Okay. Perfect. I don't want to close this and then we lose the, the comments. And yep. No, I've got it. To, I've got it copied and saved into a note now. Okay. Thank you. You can Amazing. send that to me and then I will get it done. Excellent. Okay. Jonah, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>